today. It's my first time at this congregation, so I'm glad to be here, and I hope that we get to build a lot of new friendships. It means a lot to me to get to come and teach and visit with you. I've got some friends here that I've known for a really long time and just consider it a wonderful blessing to be in the area. Uh, San Antonio is kind of special to, to me. I've been married. November will be 25 years if the Lord allows it, and we had our honeymoon here in San Antonio, so it means a lot to us, and we visit a lot. Uh, one of my best friends in the whole world, David Osteen, preaches at the O'Connor Road Church not far from here, so we visited, spent some time with them, and it's just really a wonderful thing, and as long as we're in Texas, we're good. I mean, every place in Texas is good, and we're just thankful to get to study God's Word together. Some of what we'll be doing this week, we don't get very long, four days, not long. It'll be, when, if you hate this and me, it, four days will be like that, and I'll be gone. Four days go really, really fast. We get six lessons together. And what we're going to be building towards is this very simple concept called missions of mercy. This basic idea that the Lord saved you for a purpose. And if you're saved and you're still here, there has to be a reason bigger than yourself. Because if the idea was just for you to be saved, then let's, let's go. Like, why, why would you still be here if you've already achieved the greatest possible height? And yet in passages like Ephesians 2, we learn that the Lord saved us so that we could go out and do his work, his work for us to do. The punchline of that is that the work is the people and that what God wants us to do is go out and interact with people who are hurting and distracted and lost and help to bring them to Christ. And we need to lead with mercy. Everything about the way we interact with them should be mercy based. And so when we get to tomorrow night and Tuesday night, you're going to hear that just as plainly as I can share it with you, how to love people like God loves them and how to go out and interact with them in productive ways. Now, I do want to just touch on that this morning. I want to put something into your mind, a picture from the life of Jesus that will really drive the theme. So I want you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. If our little ones were in the room this morning, they could tell you exactly what this story is about. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, and he climbed up in a sycamore tree because the Lord he wanted to see. Now, we all know that part of the story. I want to pick up with what comes next. Are you in Luke chapter 19? And again, while you're reading this, this is a basic picture from the life of Jesus that we want to capture for the week. Pick up with me in verse 5. When Jesus, Luke 19, 5, came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. Verse 7, when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, he has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now we have several preachers in the room, uh, Mr. Evans and Tyler and others. We all have our Zacchaeus sermon. And I guess I could do like a Zacchaeus week. And I can encourage you all to be more like Zacchaeus. But it's Sunday morning. Like you've already done the Zacchaeus thing, haven't you? Haven't you already sought Jesus And he came into your life and you answered his call and and he asked you to repent and you've done it. I mean, we could all be more like Zacchaeus, I guess, but I'm not really here to convince you to be like someone you've already become like. And after all, this is not even a Zacchaeus story. Did you know that? This is a Jesus story. This is about Jesus busy. You guys think Jesus was ever busy? You think his work was really, really important? Would you say his work was more important than your work? And in the middle of a day doing great work, he sees this this tax collector in a tree. And he stops what he's doing. And he goes to this guy in a tree and he doesn't say, hey, you need to fix it and walks off. He doesn't say, hey, come down and follow us or else. What does he say? He says, I'm going to change my whole day and I'm going to go to your house. I want you to come down. We're going to your house. We're going to change everything about the day because I am willing to go completely out of my way to save One person who is seeking. This story is about what Jesus would do that I don't think I would have done. And my encouragement to you this week is not just become more like Zacchaeus. Let's become more like Jesus. Let's become the people who are searching for the small guy in the tree. The person who is hurt or doubting or confused. And let's not just go, hey, we go to church over here. Let's go to them. 
and try and save them. There's another character in this story. They're called the they of verse 7. You guys know who they were? They were the Pharisees, the officials, the religious superpower, the A-team. They looked at this man in a tree and they were like, what we're doing is too important for that guy. And if that guy wants to be one of us, he's got to jump like nine hurdles and maybe we'll let him in. We cannot be like they were, verse 7. We have to change to be more like Jesus. This is my first time visiting here, so I'm not picking on you or anybody else. But I do think there are some churches and church cultures in our country, and it's like we built this six-foot wall around our church building. And if you want to come be a part of us, you got to come find us. And we've got this ladder in the back with five steps on it. And if you can find a way to climb it and fall in here, maybe we'll kind of start incorporating you in. Look, some people will come and jump the wall to be a part of the body of Christ. But others are just going to climb up in a tree and look around. The question is, can we break down those walls and go get those people? And if some of those people have drifted, are we willing to open the gates and go find them again? That's a lot of what we're going to do Monday night and Tuesday night. And I just wanted you to get that image of Jesus going in your mind. Now, for today's study, I wanted to pick a parable or two that can help us work on our attitude. In fact, just to let you know, I don't know if you'll be here tonight, but we get three lessons today. And here's what all three of today's lessons are about. They're about you pulling out a mirror and staring yourself right in the face and asking yourself a question. Missions of mercy, am I ready for this? Am I ready to go? Am I ready to go to that guy's house? Am I ready to start looking around at the reason God is still letting me breathe? Have I gotten over some of my stuff so that I can finally go be for others what God wants me to be? Does that sound fun? It's not. But it's very important. So all three lessons today are about self-evaluation, preparing us to go on missions of mercy. I want you in your Bibles, please, in Matthew chapter 20. What I've done today, this is my first time to play with, oh, let's check that out. There, I did that, just messing with it. What I wanted to do this morning, we don't have a lot of time, but I wanted to look at a parable that can help us just assess our attitude a little bit. Our attitude about ourselves, about one another, about the way we see those in the world. This morning I was eating my breakfast at the hotel and I was looking at this room full of people kind of meandering about. And I was the only one in a tie in the whole place, I think. And I was looking around thinking, what do they think of me and what do I think of them? And how am I supposed to do this? And am I, am I better than them? Am I stronger than them? Am I more worthy? Like, how do I see myself with reference to the people God wants me to interact with. And to me, it doesn't get much better than this parable. So I'm going to head over there with you. Go with me to Matthew chapter 20. It starts with a very interesting line at the end of the previous chapter. In fact, the whole parable is really designed to decode this line. Verse 30, many who are first will be last and last first. And then in chapter 20 and verse 15, so the last shall be first and the first last. Now, for them, that was a very difficult line. It's probably a little easier for you. You have the whole New Testament and the whole Old Testament, and you get to read everything that that Jesus said. But at this time, they were probably looking at that as puzzled as could be. I mean, after all, what was the number one argument among disciples? Who was the greatest? Who's the best? Who's done the most? Who's the most worthy? Who gets the best seat? The Pharisees wanted to be first. The disciples always wanted to be first. And so ultimately, Jesus is teaching them that my kingdom is different than anything you've ever been a part of in your whole life. In my kingdom, the more lowly you are, the more useful you are, and the greater you are. So to help them understand that, and and I'll tell you, Matthew 20, interesting place to start the week. It's a pretty difficult phrase that we're helped by maybe one of the most difficult parables. So I thought we'd just jump in. Let me read this story, and you see if you can figure out what it's designed to do to help your attitude about yourself and about others. Here's the story, Matthew 20. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those he said, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out, verse 5, about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and he did the same thing. 
And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, verse 7, no one has hired us. He said to them, then you go into the vineyard too. When evening came, verse 8, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages beginning with the last group to the first. I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner saying, these last men have worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day. But he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful, verse 15, for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. I don't know if that helped very much. That's a tough parable. That parable may be even more challenging than the line that he's trying to explain in it. And one of the things about this parable that's always given me fits is that it doesn't look anything like the kingdom to me. You know, if I took you to the book of Romans to read about the kingdom, would it tell you that here's how the kingdom works? You guys read it? You want to be in the kingdom? You work all day and you get paid what you deserve. Is that what the kingdom's like? Romans 4 says the opposite of that. It says, the, the kingdom and the blessings of God's righteousness are not as a result of works. You don't work 12 hours, 12 years, 12 whatever, and then get paid. And in fact, in Romans 6, if at the end of your labor, yours, God lined us all up and he said, you know what, I'm going to just go ahead and pay you what you deserve for your work. What would you get? I would get incinerated. I would get nothing. So why, Jesus, did you build a story that you you changed and you altered a bit on purpose? You told it in a way that is not like the kingdom. Why did you do that? And here's why I think Jesus did that. Because that's the way they saw the kingdom. They saw the kingdom as, I put in the most work, I deserve the most reward. I've been here the longest, I should establish some sense of superiority. If you haven't done what I have done, then you have more to do than I do. And it shouldn't be equal because I've done so much. It's a terrible concept for Christians because it elevates us. And probably the reason that he's telling this is that's the way they think. And I wish I could tell you that nobody in the church thinks like that. That there's nobody who thinks that somehow they deserve more or they're better or others need to jump some walls or some hurdles to get to their level. But we get into that rut of thought and you say, no, we don't. No, we don't. Well, I think if we truly could stop thinking like that guy who worked all day, we would be out there shaking those sycamore trees. Well, don't shake them. He might fall and hurt himself. We'd be out there going to anybody and everybody and our message wouldn't be, hey, come be like us. Our message would be, I'm just like you. Let's go find Jesus together. Like this whole sense would change. And so a couple of thoughts here on this. How do we figure out this parable? I've studied this thing for my life, and sometimes I think I get it, and sometimes I don't. There's one possible meaning that's not really about you and me, and it's worth talking about. It's quite possible that what Jesus is doing here is really about these Jews who would reject the Gentiles who would come later. You know how the kingdom unfolded. It was for Jews first. Jews suffered greatly. In fact, for generations and generations, they had suffered greatly. They'd really put in their time. And as a result of that, some of them would finally be able to reap the blessings if they could understand Jesus. Gentiles would come later, and some of them would come after the persecution and on down the line. And so maybe what he's saying is, look, if you think that the time you've put in as Jews makes you better than the Gentiles, then you need to change your attitude or you're not going to be in the kingdom at all. It's possible that he's doing that. Now, the second possibility does involve you and me, and I think is true even if the first thing is true, and it's what I want you to think about today. Next thing. What Jesus is ultimately teaching here is that the kingdom of heaven, and I want you to focus in on these three words. I don't have a lot of time. I don't know how much. I get, what, an hour and a half for class? Cool. Let me tell you about the kingdom that Jesus bought and paid for. 
The kingdom is for people who don't keep score. Who don't hold grudges that are based on what I deserve out of it. It is for people who are grateful, who are humble, and who are kind. And this story is about someone who was none of those things. Now, if you'd asked him, why aren't you more grateful? He'd say, because this was unfair. Why aren't you more kind? Because I did the work. Why aren't you more humble? Because I get more. But my pronouns are killing me, aren't they? I worked harder. I get more. You're going to hear it. I can't wait to preach to you guys. And the, the lesson we have coming is my favorite thing to talk about in the whole wide world. Because it takes all, these, all of this and it gets us to stop doing it. You cannot be a kingdom worker so long as your fingers are doing this. And you say, well, my fingers aren't doing that. Everybody around you can see them even if you can't. Me, mine, what I did, what I deserve, how great I am. All of those comparisons. This story is about Jesus telling it in a way. He's altered it from kingdom sort of specificity just to show them this is how you see it now i've got a question or two and then we're going to break into something here two questions about the story you've worked 12 hours those are long work days do you think what the landowner did in this story was fair we got some mixed so by the way I'm, i'm in texas so i know where i am i'm not up there and i'm not wearing a coat so i know you can talk um, I know how that all those variations change. So I think the answer is yes. Because he said, I'm going to pay you that. Did he give him what he told him he'd give him? He did. I'm kind of like you, though. I'm, I'm shook about it. But I'm going, he gave him exactly what he said he was going to give him. If he wanted to give the 5 o'clock guy who worked one hour a full day's wage, could, does he have the right to do that? He does. So in that sense... It was all very fair, but that's not my real question. My real question is, would you like it? I would not like it. If I had worked all day and these guys are just sort of filing in afterwards and I put in the time, I mean, the last guy like barely had a chance to learn a couple of names and he got the same amount that I got. I don't think I would like it and I don't think you would like it. There are a few people in the room right now going, I'd be perfectly fine with it because I just love that everybody got loved. And I love that blessings pour forth into everyone's life who is richly blessed by grace. I'm not making fun of you. I want to be more like you. I want to think like you and feel like you and converse like you with people who are in the church and who are outside of church. I want to be more like you. But most of us are not so much like you. So here's what I want to do for a few minutes in this story. I'm going to make... Three changes. You know, Jesus kind of altered it from accurate kingdom registry to kind of emphasize their scorekeeping. I'm going to make three changes to this story. And I believe that any one of these three changes would make you okay with the way things turned out. It was fair from the beginning. But I think I can help you like it. Three changes we're going to make. Here's the first one. And by the way, keep these three words in mind because the three points relate to the three words. Number one, what if... You weren't working 12 hours for a full day's wage. I mean, everybody here has done that. Maybe you worked all day for a full day's wage. What if somebody came to you and said, I want you to work 12 hours, and I'm going to give you a silver case with a million dollars in it? Now, you should not believe them. And I would suggest if somebody says that to you that you don't. But for some reason, you did. You believed them. And you went to work at 6 in the morning. And all day, what are you thinking about all day? This can't can't be real. This, This can't work out. But somehow, you have this thing we call faith and you decide to do it and so you work all day and so after at nine o'clock they hire a guy <laughs> at noon they hire some guys and at three o'clock they hire some guys and at five o'clock they hire some guys and so you're getting to the end of the day and what are you still thinking maybe 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 this is real my life's about to change and so the the five o'clock guy is getting paid first and out comes a silver case with a million dollars in it he's been there an hour okay what are you thinking at that moment There is someone in the room right now doing the math, going, I'm about to get $12 million. And while that may make you giggle just a little bit, if you're that person, this week is for you. Because there's something in there that needs a little bit of work. You see what I'm saying? 
if I'm watching this, I'm going, this guy gets a million, and this guy gets a million, and this guy gets a million, and this, what am I thinking? I'm thinking, give me one more case, come on. Tell me you got one more back there. I am so grateful for what I'm about to receive that I didn't earn, that I don't deserve, that's so far beyond fair that the fact that other people are getting it just excites me to the possibilities that I may get it because they're not worthy and guess who else ain't worthy? This guy. And you get the case and it has a million dollars in it and you celebrate. How many of you go out in the parking lot and go, okay guys, everybody rally up. Uh, that was not properly and equitably dispensed. Let's create a little sump fund here. and let No, we don't do that. We celebrate. Now, while that is not the way Jesus told the story, if you would go with me to 1 Peter chapter 1, it is an accurate telling of what it means to be a Christian. In 1 Peter chapter 1, chapter 1 in verses like it, we learn that when you found the grace of the Lord, he promised you riches beyond anything you'll ever deserve. He promised you an inheritance that is totally unfair. And yet he's going to give it to you by his grace. We are blessed beyond any measure. And until we're walking around just grateful to be a part of it, we'll always keep score. And it'll always be about winning and what we perceive to be fairness. I love this whole text, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To obtain, let me tell you, an inherit. Forget the million dollars. That's nothing. That's just a silly piece of a made-up story. We can do way better than that. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed. He said, verse 6, it might be tough. You might have to go through some trials. It may not be easy. Your workload may be different than someone else's workload. You may have to put in more. You may suffer more, but it's not going to matter. Because no matter what, it's just going to be a proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Can we do two more verses? And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Now, I'm sorry, but I use my hands a lot and I can't stop. Look in verse 9. Is it obtain as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls? Is that the way we should, if I was going to use hands for that, Reagan, is that the way I would do that? I'd go, no, I would say you would receive as the outcome of your faith. Eternal salvation of your souls. We are blessed beyond any metric or measure. And let me tell you what gratitude does. When you're just thankful to be a part of this thing. And every good thing you've ever done wouldn't make you worth the first benefit of the Lord. And yet by grace and through his patience, he has helped you establish your faith and you are confident in him. It will change the way you see the world. It will change the way tomorrow night. It will change the way you see people who've drifted from your church. It's not, well, okay, we're the ones that are going to keep fighting and get it. And they're the ones who I guess don't, I guess they're not willing to put in the work. No amount of work's going to be enough. Let's go get those people. And let's go to them and say, this is the greatest treasure in the universe. This is worth giving your whole life for. Let gratitude lead your evangelism and you will become more evangelistic. It can't be about us. It has to be about him. So I would hope that that would change your mind. And you would say, okay, you're right. I'm incredibly blessed and I need to go to people in a way that just shares that blessing with them. Let me go back and change a second thing. Go back to our story if you need to reference it again in Matthew chapter 20. So the first alteration just reflects a more accurate representation of what it means to be a Christian. And there ought to be gratitude pouring out of our voices in singing. Now, the million dollars has gone away for our second part of our illustration. I'm only going to change one thing at a time. The million dollars is gone. I did bring a million dollars in a case. The first person who raised their hand five minutes ago was going to get it. Nobody did. So I'm taking no, there's no million dollars. It's gone. But I don't even need to offer that in this story change the way you would feel if you'd worked all day. Can I change something else? 
And this would be accurate to very much what Jesus was trying to infuse in the story. What, what, if, what if you knew and loved everyone else in that line? I know you've worked the hardest. I know you've done the most. I know you're the A-lister, the, the super committed person. You've been a Christian this long. You've been through this month. You've this much. You fought these battles. You've worked the 12-hour day. But what if the guy who got there at 5 p.m. was one of your best friends in the world? who had been living on nearly nothing and didn't think God even knew him anymore, and he got blessed with a full day's wage for one hour. Would you be happy about that? What if the person who got there near the end of the day was a family member of yours who's going through hard times, or someone who has a spouse that has cancer and the medical bills are piling up? And there's this thing in your heart that has to trigger. It's called compassion. If you read the Gospels, Jesus is driven by compassion. If he compared himself to everyone else, he wouldn't have helped anyone. Jesus wouldn't have helped anyone, but he found this great love and compassion. In fact, the great two commandments of all time are what? Love God and love your neighbor, the people who are around you. I would like to think that if you knew these people, if you love these people, and at the end of the day, you saw them getting full day's wages, you would be happy for them. But again, there's probably one or two people in the room right now going, I'd like to tell you I'd be happy for them, but at the same time, I'm just telling you that's still unfair. I still worked harder. I still deserve more. I'm glad you got it. I'd be more like this. I'm glad you got it, but I'm still expecting 12 times as much. You see that language? I can't get over myself. I'm stuck. I'm stuck in a me view. I'm happy for you. And let me just tell you, if, you're, if your statements about people are, I'm happy for you, but, and then your fingers turn this way, I don't think you're really happy for them. I don't know that you really love them. So one of the things that has to change is we have to become the kind of people who love our neighbors. I'm sitting there eating my, my egg thing in the hotel. You guys had the little egg thing. I don't know what's in that thing. I think there's eggs in it. And I'm eating it, and I'm just looking around at all these people and these families, and I'm thinking, God wants me to love those people just as much as I love the Harrison family. God wants me to see them, and if they just sneak in at the last minute and they find grace, then I have fulfilled my purpose, and I need to live giving myself so that they can benefit. When we truly start loving, this is tomorrow night's lesson, when we truly start loving people like Jesus loves people, there's a chance you won't only sit over here and go, Man, I'm really happy they got that. There's a chance you may walk over there and go, you know what? What? Why don't you take mine too? You're going, like, that's so different than keeping score and, and holding tallies and winners and losers. Very Christ-like. It's almost like saying, I got a whole day plan, and there's some tax collector in a tree, and I'm going to go reroute my entire day just to be with that man and give him what he needs. That's the heart of a disciple, and we all need it. And we can't be useful for God until we find it. Let me give you another story. I was trying to decide this morning which parable to teach on as the primary. I chose this because it allows me to show you the other as well. Go with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. You know this one? The parable of the good Samaritan. Let's read it for just a moment. It's another way of telling the same story. You have to decide who am I in this story and how do I interact with others and what do I feel for them. Uh, I was reading this. This is part of our daily Bible read at home. So I just happened to be reading it yesterday. And, you know, the whole setup about the lawyer who thought he was a great neighbor. You know, the law keeper thinks that he's doing it well. And then he finds out there's actually a heart component, a compassion component a sacrifice component. I think he gets floored by that. But here's the story. Who is my neighbor, he says. Jesus said, and I'll read it for you. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers. They stripped him. They beat him. They went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on the road. And by the way, I always imagine that the priest is on his way to church. He's going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passes by on the other side. He's got places to go. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw this guy, he passed by on the other side. He's a very busy man. But a Samaritan, who again in the story is kind of the guy you would least expect it from. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, what's the first thing that it says? He felt compassion. You see that? He felt compassion. It's about love for others. 
Well, what did he do with that compassion? Well, he came to the guy and he bandaged up his wounds. He poured oil and wine on them. He put him on his own beast. He brought him to an inn. He took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii. There's your denarii part of the story. He took two denarii. That's two days' wage. Gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Which one of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed, and I love this word, I'm in love with this word, I'm trying to redefine my life by this word, the one who showed mercy toward him. Jesus said, go and do the same. It's not just go out and be great and keep the rules and do well. It's not about establishing yourself. And that's really kind of tough on us because going to worship is commanded. It's important that you come to church. It's important that you're consistent in worship and and worshiping the right ways and doing all those things. But you know, you're not like mounding up credit, right? I mean, you get that. Just give me a little nod that goes, I get that. Some of you are going, could you restate that for my thinking? You're not mounding up any credit here. You're supposed to be fueling up so you can go out and love people. I don't know, it's like we just stay at the fuel station and get like extra tanks and just keep going, look at all the tanks I've start, started up of like churchiness. What are we doing? We're trying to win. We want to be the best. We want to establish ourselves. Don't stop this, but stop that. We've got to be the kind of people who are looking to pour it out in love. Uh, now, it's a very interesting parable to me because there's three categories of people in the world that you can you can take in anything and you can say there's three categories of people in the world there are three categories of people in the world and they're all in this story i'm talking about luke 10 number one there are takers you guys know about takers takers think what's yours is mine they steal they rob they don't care if they hurt you they don't care what happens to you they just want what they want they're a small sliver of the world we live in i believe it's a pretty small sliver but they are the robbers in the story The robbers take, they leave you half dead, they don't care how they leave you. There are no takers in the room today. I I mean, you could come forward now if you are, but I don't think there are. But in this world, there are takers. On the other end of this world, there's a fairly small sliver of people called givers. Givers are the Samaritan. He's not even supposed to be around there. Most people wouldn't even talk to him. He's a Samaritan traveling through Jewish territory, and he sees this guy. Givers feel compassion. They're, pro- they're not keeping score. They just want to give. They want to help. They want to support. They feel like the fulfillment of, of being a Christian is actually being like Jesus, which I think is so noble and kind of like, duh. And they give, and they give to the Lord. And you know there are people in this room like that, and, but we're not all naturally like that. Is that a fair statement? We all need to be like that. We're all not naturally like that. And in the middle, as large as this table, is this huge middle category that I naturally fit in called keepers. I'm a keeper. I'm a, hey, I'll pray for you, but I'm going to keep what's mine. I worked hard for it. God gave it to me. It's a blessing in my life. I'm going to put it in my savings account. I'm going to put it in my Apple stock. I'm going to do my thing. This is God giving to me. I don't, I'm not going to steal from the guy in the ditch. I'm not going to go, let's see if he's got anything left in there. Like, I'm not that guy. But you know what? God will handle that guy like God has handled me. And my predisposition is to be a keeper. This guy says, what's yours is mine. This guy says, what's mine is yours. This guy says, hey, what's mine is mine. What's yours is yours. That's my predisposition. That's the guy that you have preaching for you this week. I'm sorry for that. But I'll tell you what I'm working on every day. I'm working on being more like that guy. Because I don't think Jesus said, I forget, help me if I misquote this. I always try to quote scripture accurately. I think it said, many will be saved and few will be lost. Is that the way way Jesus said it? Did he say, I'm going to kick out those takers. I'm going to save everybody else. He said, few. Few will be saved. Many will be lost. I've got to stop being a keeper. Start being a giver. And you can't get there without compassion. You can't do it. And love and gratitude. The kingdom is for the grateful. I'm blessed with countless riches in the Lord that I don't deserve. With kindness towards others. And then lastly, as we get down to this, with with humility. All right, so love for others. We'll build it. Let's put a placeholder in that. We'll build on that tomorrow night. I'm going to make one more change. Go back to our story in case you need to take a peek at it. Go back to our story. It's in Matthew chapter 20, but we'll, we'll talk about it. You see what goes on there. Third thing that we could change in this story, and I, I hope you'd be okay with it. 
the way I told the story and the way Jesus told the story, because he was addressing these scribes and Pharisees and arrogance and stuff, is it made it look like you were the 11th hour person. But what if you're not? Question, does the story change if you're not? I mean, the all day person, it was pictured as if you were the all day person. Does the story change? I mean, so far I've pictured it as if you and I were over here, the valiant workers. We've done so much. I mean, look at this tie. It's well tied. We are pros at this. And we're putting in the time. And these guys come straggling in. I mean, this guy's got a tattoo on his face. This guy's in shorts. Like, these, who, who are these people? Like, they're just going to stumble in and think that they're going to get what I'm going to get? If you don't like specifics like that, don't come back this week. Well, it's your church. I'll leave. You stay. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, like, it's easy to just picture it. I'm just giving you examples. It's easy to picture it. But what if, what if you're not the all-day guy? What if you were the one who got brought in at 5 p.m.? Or how about this? I always picture myself as a 559-59 guy. You hear me? I didn't go through the persecutions of the first century. I haven't labored through the martyrdom of the hundred years that followed. I just, somebody, my parents taught me the gospel and I believed it. And my whole life has been blessed by the grace of God. Like, I'm a 559. I'm in Christ for one second. And he says, heaven, million dollars, eternity, and glory. Does the story change? Because if I was hired at 5 p.m. and I showed up. And I'm like, he's not going to give me a full day's thing for just, for just an hour. And, and he, he said, here's your day's wage. How do you think I would feel? I'd be elated. This is amazing. I've been here an hour. I don't deserve any of that. But what would it mean to me? Stick with me. What would it mean to me if I'm going, this is the, most, this is the, this is the best thing I think has ever happened to me. I've been here an hour. And I look down at all my fellow workers and they're scowling at me. You remember those guys from the opening of our story? They're down here going, that's not fair. That's not right. And, and like they don't really have a case, but they do treat me differently because they're better than me. Like there's a chance that, that all I want to be is encouraged. What ought to happen is everybody on that row ought to come and give me the biggest hug it's ever been given. You just got blessed beyond even us. And we're excited for you and thankful for you because I don't know how you saw yourself in this story, but I got news for you. There's not a person in this room who's the all day worker who's put in the most work to receive the greatest reward. And what I'm talking about is this thing called humility. You say, well, I don't know, Chris. I mean, if you really get down to it, age and experience and commitment to God and battles fought and sacrifices made, there are probably people here who've put in a little more work than the other. I'm not going to disagree with that. But I would like you to go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, please. Is that five minutes? 1 Timothy chapter 1. We'll get into this tomorrow night as well. So I'm just going to see if I can find it. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Remember the Apostle Paul? I would think the Apostle Paul would be like a 12-hour guy. I mean, does it get any better than the Apostle Paul? If anybody had a right to elevate themselves or make people try to be more like them or throw their authority around, wouldn't it have been him? Paul was the all-day best worker maybe of the bunch, and he never pictured himself as anything more than a guy who slipped in at the last second. You feel that? Let's read it. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has, put, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Let me tell you about me. I was a formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. I was the worst. Yet I was shown, there's our word, mercy, because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Yet for this reason, I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the king, not me, to him, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, you're going to have to hear all that again tomorrow night, this text. But even though he had a right to throw his weight around, he approached every new city saying, look at me. I am the worst. I am the least. If hell was made for anyone, hell was made for me. But God saved me. It's unbelievable that God allowed me in. If God can save me, I know God can save you. Folk, that's powerful evangelism. You're going to hear it again tomorrow. But if at any point 
The person you're talking to thinks you're here and they're here. The conversation is over. You can keep talking if you want to, but nobody's listening. Paul came in like this, humble to the core and grateful, and he lifted people up from beneath him. That's the way it works. Hey, a uh, quick last story. I have three minutes. I think it's a three-minute story. It's perfect. I was reading a book. Uh, some guy gave me a book on neurological. I can't even remember the name of the book. I was not going to read that book. It had a big brain on it. And he said later, did you read the book? I said, I'll take a look at the book. So I read the first chapter, and it was about a guy in Chicago. I ended up reading a little more later, but the first chapter was the hook. There was a guy in Chicago, the author of the book, who was going to dinner at a swanky place in downtown Chicago, Illinois. And there was a homeless man there on the side of the road with a, with a jar begging, in it, and he had a sign. And the sign says, um, hungry, please help. And people were just passing the guy by. Nobody was helping the guy. He's the guy on the side of the road. Everybody's got places to go. And so the man walked by, and he stopped, and he said, you know what? I'll make you a deal. I'll put five, I think my numbers, I think this is what it was. I'll put $5 in your can right now. You're hungry. I will help you. But if you'll let me alter your sign a little bit, just change your sign a little bit, then I'll go to dinner, and in an hour and a half when I come out, I'll give you, I think, $20. So he's homeless, but he's not dumb. So he said, I'll take that deal. I mean, $5 for $20. So he gives the man the sign. The man who wrote this book turns it over, changes the words, puts it in, and he goes in, and he comes out. And true story, he said, when I come out to give the man the rest of the money, the man gets up and hugs me and says, I'm so thankful for you. You've completely changed my whole night. And he actually gave me $10. He said, I made $5 off a homeless guy for consulting. And it was something about the way he changed the way they saw that guy that changed the way everybody interacted with that guy. Would you like to know what was on that sign? Well, time's up. All he did was turned it into the form of a question. Instead of, hungry, please help, and people were going, not hungry, hungry, got places to go. He turned it over and he wrote, what if you were hungry? So now I'm walking by, and I see that person, and I don't just see that person. I actually see who? I see me. I go, what, what if I was hungry? Some people probably walk by. This is Chicago, right? Things change fast there. And said, that was me. Somebody helped me and changed my life. When people saw themselves, humility, when they saw themselves in the place of this man, and when you couple that with an actual compassion for the man, People will go to the world's end to help them. Here's the thing. It's not fictional, folks. Your neighbors, the people you work with, the people who are in the lobby with me today, the people who've drifted from the church, we're going to talk about all that this week. This isn't theoretical. Yes, they're in the spiritual ditch, but that is where you were. And in some ways, in terms of worthiness, it's where we're always going to be. Has somebody shown you mercy? Has somebody lifted you up beyond what you deserve? feels great, doesn't it? Go and do the same. That's what Jesus taught us, and it'll change the world in his name. Thank you guys for your good attention.